Smedley Butler, Marine veteran of over 33 years and soldier of American imperialism in the early 20th century, eventually became a stringent voice against offensive wars and interventionism, and would go so far as to define his entire career in the military in hindsight as a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. His heroism, as defined by the US government in the Philippines, Panama, Haiti, and beyond, led him to be one of the most decorated soldiers in American history, including two separate medals of honor, one of which was not completely bogus as defined by Butler himself. These ornate decorations and popular lot are part of what led Smedley, after a handful of decades working for the American Empire, to slowly begin to look at the machine behind all the orders he so dutifully followed and see that he was not fighting to, quote, free little Cuba, the thought which led him into the Marines at the age of 16, but rather for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. A myth is developed around Smedley. Some hail him as one of the greatest soldiers in, in history, and some quote him championing a solely defensive military as a necessary course for the future. Some see his implementation of a militarized police force in Philadelphia as part of the issues of modern policing, and some see his cries against capitalism and actions against fascism in the United States as heroic. The truth about Smedley Butler's life, though, is a contradiction. The man who invaded half a dozen nations and supplanted near as many democracies is the same man who would decry imperialism. Why his life is so fascinating, then, is because he at least notices this thread, and despite his history, follows conscience and acknowledges his life's contradictions, when so many others in a similar lot have either not realized or continued to live into the lie. Looking into his notes and correspondence throughout his decades of military service, a proverbial journey can be charted of his experiences and shifting temperament, and pivotal moments can be construed that led to Smedley Butler's rather radical change of heart, the belief that war is a racket, began to be formulated from his military beginnings in Cuba and was finally voiced a decade later in Nicaragua and Haiti as his temperament transitioned out of imperialistic jingoism into an ardent socialist voice for his fellow veterans and against the fascist movement of the 1930s. Smedley was born into an influential family that, though Quaker in belief, was certainly not pacifist. <laughs> Smedley's father, Thomas Stocker Butler, was a representative of Pennsylvania in Congress for just over 30 years. According to Smedley's mythology of his father, as portrayed in Old Gimlet Eye, <laughs> an interesting autobiography told in the first person but written and edited by Lowell Thomas, he was a man that, though Quaker, openly championed the expansion of the American military, telling of a time when, quote, Father had just made a speech on the floor of Congress, advocating for a good-sized navy. Leaving the house in the corridor of the Capitol, he met a pacifist who said to him, Thee is a fine friend. And Father replied, saying, Thee is a damn fool. End quote. <laughs> Because Old Gimlet Eye is essentially oral history, it's important to look at much of the fine details told here as hyperboil, but even so, it's still a useful tool to get to know Smedley, if not exactly the facts of the events he, that he experienced. It can be, reasonably re can be reasonably inferred from his regular correspondence with his mother throughout his life that Smedley held his family and childhood in high esteem. These letters between the two of them, along with his correspondence with others, will be a large piece in assembling a map of Smedley's changing thoughts and convictions around his duty as a soldier and citizen of the United States. Smedley came into the Marines during the Spanish-American War with grandiose ideals of his role assisting the American Empire. The culture of manifest destiny was rampant at the time, and imperialism was an ever more appealing notion to the American businessman and therefore politician. <laughs> Much of the American population at the time was still hesitant to get behind overseas expansionism, but luckily it was the turn of the 19th century and the narrative of far-off lands and their peoples and actions were easily controlled and distorted. During the Spanish-American War, an all-too-familiar phenomenon developed that has come to be known as yellow journalism. The term was coined as popular editors like William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, of the Pulitzer Prize fame for literary prowess and integrity, <laughs> began to specifically push a narrative of in interventionalism on behalf of the Cuban Revolution against the Spanish occupation. In itself, this can seem innocuous enough until hindsight finds that this exact message has been used to coax populaces the world over into accepting, even if begrudgingly, intervention on behalf of a supposedly needy and persecuted underdog. From the Philippines to Vietnam to Afghanistan to even Ukraine, it's all a frightfully similar story, and the innocent hero narrative never ends up translating to reality. Young Smedley was not at all immune to the narrative, and he spent his youth restless to see the world and fight for all the archetypal American ideals that he had grown up loving and holding to. Smedley signed up for the Marines with his mother's help at the age of 16, with the ideal that he would be liberating the Cubans from the tyrannical Spanish occupiers. 
Because of his father's influence, Smedley joined as an officer, and after just six weeks of training, which he would say planted the seed of soldiering that he was never able to shake, he was promptly shipped out to Cuba to begin his lifelong journey as an agent for imperialism. He first arrived in Cuba weeks after much of the major fighting had ended. Landing in Guantanamo, he was in the perfect place to witness the beginning of both his career and the empire he was helping to create. It was a conviction that led Smedley into the military, and what he found in Cuba did not at all match his expectations. Upon first landing, he and his fellow officers were disorientated, much to the amusement of the veteran enlisted men already there. <laughs> Smedley remembers being young and hot-headed and snapping at one of them for making fun of his much-yet-unearned stature, which of course just led the laughter into even greater uproar. Eventually, one of the old men took pity upon him and showed his way, though. Even though Butler arrived after much of the fighting had concluded, much to his colleagues' outward chagrin, inwardly it seems that he was much relieved. There were still some occasional skirmishes, though, when he was assigned to lead a group of 30 men on outpost duty. Thankfully, to 16-year-old Butler, the men he was supposedly leading needed no ordering or direction. He recalled of that first real night outside safety by saying, If I ever live to be 500, I can never again endure the panic and bewilderment of that night. He signed up to help save the poor Cubans being, quote, starved and murdered by the beastly Spanish tyrants with the hope that he would play a heroic role in the liberation of the people, though he later recognized that he had no real care or knowledge of the island nation before the main sunk, the impetus or at least the excuse for American intervention in Cuba. A brief time in Cuba imprinted a love for soldiering and a deep sense of responsibility for his men, which would later, even given all of his faults, prove to be nothing but genuine and unwavering. Quote, now any fool can be a good man, but if he tries hard enough, not every man will make a good soldier. So I will devote my energies towards the latter, and the former will follow, I think, end quote. Butler wrote his mother in early 1900 this, before arriving in the Philippines for the first time. He certainly would achieve the latter, and as, as his next year would have him getting shot on two separate occasions, and one heroic act to save a fellow soldier that would give all involved a Medal of Honor, which Smedley only did not receive at the time because officers then were not eligible for its reception. His first day in the Philippines was brief, but it was his first experience in a war far away from Ameri the American homeland and popular interest. Few Americans at the time had heard of the Philippines and cared even less, which began to ruminate a question in Smedley's mind about what America's role in all this fighting was truly for. When he learned that he was to go with a hundred men to China, he wrote his beloved mother Maud, quote, it is needless to say that I am the happiest man alive. The Marines were told their primary objective in China was to keep Americans safe from the Boxer Rebellion, and Smedley apparently took this at face value. After weeks of grueling marching through the wilderness under constant threat of fire, Butler revised his stance and swore to leave the military if, ever, if he ever made it out alive. Though once he reached the relative safety, he would write that all of the terrible fighting, hardships, and sufferings had been worth it. To, quote, see all the women and children we have saved, end quote. It would be hard to argue that Butler did not genuinely love the turmoil of his perceived duty. After all, the only way a man can sleep at night, I think, after doing and seeing such things is to call it good. <laughs> China would also give him his second bullet wound. This time, he was saved from certain death by a brass button attached to his clothing. Needless to say, wrote Smedley to his mother, I have kept the button and will have it gold-plated for thee. He was an outstanding soldier and, at least according to the men he risked life and limb to save, that surely made him a good man as well. To be able to affirm honestly, though, we have to look into some of the less favorable deeds of Butler in the Marines, the accounts of which we have from his own pen and recollection. Later, Smedley would say that upon reaching the destroyed city of Peking, he and his men were devastated to find no loot worthy of plunder. They ransacked a palace and buried some of what they thought was gold, only to come back and find it was just brass. He boasted that they were the first foreigners to, quote, desecrate this holy territory, end quote, and had poetically to say of it, quote, what a disappointment. Because there was no gold, silver, or sparkly jewels to plunder, they, quote, were filled with contempt for those Chinese rulers who were satisfied to live in musty old palaces, end quote. Curiously, he never mentioned the looting and violent burning of half of Tianston in his letters home to his beloved mother. Uh, <laughs> read into that what you will. The Boxer Rebellion was a brutal period in Chinese history. In some degrees, what transpired there is similar to many of America's modern military interventions, where there was actually some danger or you know, specific interest for the American citizens, but it was not really the primary motive behind military mobilization. Regardless of what the U.S.'s involvement of the impetus of the rebellion really was, one thing can be stated factually, 
and that's that the U.S. didn't leave China in a better place than they had found it, and the deaths of untold thousands of innocent Chinese civilians are a lasting legacy on the U.S. and its allies and their commitment in the 19th century to imperialism. Smedley would later recognize this, though in the moment, war was still a game he saw as well worth playing. He was proud of the work he had left behind for China to deal with, and when he wrote and arrived in Honduras, he wrote that he was prepared to land and shoot anybody and anything that was breaking the peace, and also had some considerable amusement at the apparently laughable size of the Honduran military. So still, opinion and conviction of his actions had not much changed, at least in his writings. They wandered around Honduras, or, quote, the most godforsaken place, end quote, Smedley had ever stumbled upon in an effort to protect American interests. Arriving in Truxillo, he was quite amused and perplexed by regime change when, quote, a new president, a N-word, by the name of Benilla, was elected, even though only winning 34,000 votes. A suspicion at the legitimacy of this election certainly arose, though the dots hadn't yet been connected as to what Butler thought of it. <laughs> he would admit that he had no clear idea what all the fighting in Honduras was about, and his next experience would largely continue this thread. Upon arriving in Panama, mainly to guard the Trans-Isthmus Railroad and to prepare topographical maps to assist the coming canal, he was still restless as ever with war as he saw as below him and was, quote, wilds to go as observers to the Jap War, the Russo-Japanese War. He was still much caught up in the archaic ideal of war as a glorious and noble thing, and it took seeing the human devastation of the First World War for this idea to finally be completely cleared from Butler's conscience, but that's later. <laughs> after taking his new wife on a European honeymoon, and after heading to the Philippines once again to take up a new post, he traveled to the Suez Canal and wrote to his father in what is now a humorous canal measurement contest, I'll call it, uh, quote, This canal, about which the British bray so much, is nothing more than one of President Roosevelt's irrigation ditches and not worthy to be compared in any way to our Panama undertaking." End quote. <laughs> he had still yet to look beyond the surface to the peoples so mercifully affected by both these undertakings. Uh, anyways, in one of his first nice things to say of a foreign country, though, he marveled in a telling act of humor at Colombo, a city near Singapore, which was, quote, "...the most civilized place we have struck yet. Modern buildings and hotels where one can sleep without a life insurance policy in one hand and a box of bug powder in the other." He was much still of the temperament of the classic early 20th century adventurer that saw as everywhere in the world that wasn't home or Western Europe as uncivilized. So even a humorous quip about a place such as this is high praise memory, maybe? I don't know. One of Smedley's most memorable stunts transpired in the Philippines when he was stationed there at one end of Manila Bay, opposite the main port. He and his men saw many supply ships pass them by and dock in Manila while their rations began to dry up. Fed up with being forgotten, Smedley and some of his men stole a dugout canoe and attempted to paddle across the bay when a large storm appeared out of nowhere and completely overwhelmed them. By an act of equal parts luck and determination, the men were able to get to the opposite end of the bay by paddling their little craft with their bare hands as their oars because they had washed away. Upon arrival, Smedley got a considerable amount of chastising from the higher-ups for his unannounced and dangerous scent. He did, though, end up getting his men their supplies. And this was the first considerable act of what I'll call soft rebellion, and would set a course for the rest of his career. These small rebellions are a large part of what made him so beloved by both his men and later the American public. The Marines today hold him in high esteem. He was the maverick Marine, which is what they called him, that always looked after his men and broke a few rules to keep him safe. As Hans Schmidt put it, he exemplified the American military contradiction. This contradiction went deeper as Smedley moved to Nicaragua. And for that, we need a little bit of backstory with some story time, I think. <laughs> story, story time. Everyone gather around, get comfortable, kick, kick back. And uh, this is where we talk about something slightly related to the video, but not really. But, but kind of, trust me, it'll pay off, I hope. Anyways, let, let's get to it. Philander Knox, then Secretary State of State under Taft, had many friends with business interests in Nicaragua. Even before Juan Estrada's coup, Knox received a letter from Nicaragua asking for protection on the premises and an insinuated reminder that many mines were owned by Pittsburgh capitalists, some no doubt known by you. That was part of the letter. <laughs> when Estrada launched his coup against Jose Santos Zela, many of those friends would dump large sums of money and resources into his aid. William Reese, a capitalist from Pittsburgh, told, told former Lelou's gold mine accountant, turned top Estrada aide Adolfo Diaz that, quote, our good friend Knox will help us, end quote. 
And sure enough, he did. Using the deaths of two American mercenaries at the hands of Zela's government, Knox called him, quote, a blot upon the history of Nicaragua, end quote, and stated that the U.S. government officially supported Estrada in their conviction that the revolution represents the ideals and the will of a majority of the Nicaraguan people more faithfully. I'm sure that was true. Adolfo Diaz would go on to be president in 1911 and succeeded by Emilio Chamorro, minister to America during Diaz's term. When Chamorro mounts his candidacy still in Washington, the U.S. sent him back on to Nicaragua on an American cruiser, essentially endorsing him as he was their favorite candidate for president. He won the presidency, though most would call his office much more that of dictator, because when his term was over, he launched another coup against his successor and took back the presidency. His fatal flaw this time, though, was failing to get American support, and after only a few months, resigned the presidency back to Philander Knox's old friend, Adolfo Diaz. It's all a racket. Anyways, back to Smedley. His first time in Nicaragua was a marked turning point when he finally began to put into words all the things that he was observing, and began to question the motives behind the wars he was involved in, and put the pieces together of all the shady influences he was seeing behind the scenes. His letters to his mother and father at the time are invaluable in finding his thoughts on the morals behind the intervention of the United States in foreign conflicts and affairs. After some colorful escapades involving a train, which we'll vaguely get to later, he reached Hinotepe and met a, quote, very polite Spanish man who owned the best coffee plantation in this section of the world that apparently made $3 million profit in 1910, which is roughly $93 million inflation adjusted today. If this hearsay can believed, and at least Smedley believed it, a foreigner was making close to $100 million a year in today's money off the land and backs of Nicaraguans. And Smedley mentions that this Spanish man was very happy to see them, and he makes no notes as to whether he thought this was suspicious or not in his letter, and he did not make the connection as to why an owner of an enormous coffee plantation would be overjoyed at the sight of the U.S. military in, say, the early 20th century. <laughs> The smooching would soon get to him, though, um, exemplifying the blatant exploitation of the nation, its resources, and peoples. Smedley arrived in Granada and met with some American businessmen, one of which was, quote, a young fellow from New York who just arrived to take charge of a gold mine, end quote. This man was unidentified, but it's possible he was one of Secretary Knox's friends. Uh, the night then escalated even further, and he was invited to a club to meet, quote, the Lacayo family, the most prominent and aristocratic clan in Nicaragua, who were all apparently also very glad to see them. The Lacayo family would remain in wealth and prom political prominence throughout the 20th century and into the 21st, likely due to their friendliness with Americans and their capital. He later tells of being forced to sit through a veritable panel on, quote, what the United States should do in the country, which served to add to the growing ledger of issues he was taking with the U.S.'s relation to Nicaragua. In release from a great crescendo of angst, on March 1st, 1910, Smedley wrote a letter addressed to his mother and father where he finally puts his long-held thoughts into words. He starts with a long list of racist grievances against the Nicaraguan, Nicaraguan revolutionaries, uh, spigs as he calls them, quote, the most worthless, useless lot of vermin I have struck yet. And this kind of talk was normal for Smedley, though what was abnormal came next. And this part's important, so pay attention if you've been dozing off the last 30 minutes. <laughs> Quote, what makes me mad is that the whole revolution is inspired and financed by Americans who have wildcat investments down here and want to make them good by putting in a government which will declare a monopoly in their favor. The whole business is rotten to the core, and I am ashamed to think that a Republican administration is, if anything, assisting the revolution. The rebel army is comprised mostly of outcasts from other countries with the usual sprinkling of soldiers of fortune. The whole game of those degenerate Americans down here is to force the United States to intervene and by so doing make their investments good. There is no patriotic movement in this revolution. The poor common people are the only sufferers, and as, all, as is always the case, and their blood will be on our heads." End quote. And that he addressed this letter to his congressman father rather than his mother as usual is particularly telling of his frustration of the events that were unfolding before his eyes. He levies specifically great confusion at the acts of the State Department, led by our old capitalist friend, Philander Knox. <laughs> in some of his classic wit, he remarked, quote, I am simply a hired policeman and am not supposed to understand the affairs of state. I can see, though, with my untrained eyes, however, that were we not in living in this town, the revolution would be over in a few minutes, end quote. 
Legitimate concerns about the moral of what he was doing on behalf of his country finally culminated in this outpouring. And while Smedley was certainly prone to the lack of outward compassion that is necessary, maybe, for soldiers to survive and wars to proliferate, as shown as ad in his attitude towards the spigs he encountered in Nicaragua, and his little brown brothers that he dealt with in the Philippines, uh, there was a genuine shame about the things he was beginning to see beyond the bloodshed, and how his beloved country was proliferating it. Not for liberty and democracy, as he had once imagined, but rather for profiteers and their congressmen. The words of thrice Dustin Kendrew. <laughs> Smedley was not all talk, though, and from his perspective, the naval officers were, quote, very much in sympathy with Estrada, the leader of one of the revolutionary forces. Having expressed his shame in the U.S.'s antics, he resolved to, quote, change this and remain absolutely neutral at all costs and stop this horrible slaughter of a poor race which does not want to fight, end quote. Though still talking in the racist rhetoric of the time, a decade of wars had grown in him what I think is a genuine empathy towards the affected populace, albeit still shrouded in the typical white American condescension of his time and ours. <laughs> Four months on, he wrote directly to his father, saying he was sickened with being forced to, quote, wield the big stick in shady diplomacy. And in quite a humorous quote, he says, these renegade swine from the slum of our race are all engaging in enterprises which, if successful, will pay them 50 to 100% dividends, but are not willing to take a gambler's risks. In other words, they have taken a 100 to 1 shot on a horse race, and for fear of losing, have called in the police to hold all the other horses, end quote. <laughs> In Old Gimlet Eye, a highly, the highly theatrical telling of his adventures, he would give an age-old excuse for his actions in Nicaragua. He was just following orders. It was not his business to understand the, quote, intricate ramifications of the situation. He was a Marine. His business was to do as told. As the epitome of the American contradiction, the fighting Quaker, he would continue following orders for the next 15 years, but his experience in Nicaragua would go on to define the laudable and likable heroic rebellions of the rest of his life. In the opening of Wars a Racket, he would write that all his time in Nicaragua was to help, quote, purify the country for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers, the majority owners of the aforementioned railroad which Butler so harrowingly defended and repaired. Smedley alludes to the railroad being American property on multiple occasions, though his decade roaming around the country. Uh, even more shockingly, Brown Brothers, along with the railroad, owned a large share in the Nicaraguan National Bank as well. <laughs> They stated that they were simply making good on their investments and that Nicaragua was all the better for their generous loans paid back to the American capitalists from the pockets of the poor Nicaraguan citizens, at interest, of course. <laughs> this, is, this is quite funny. The official website of Brown Brothers Harriman laments the loan, saying that they thought it was sound. In an entirely cringeworthy plea for compassion, they say that, quote, Nicaragua struggled to repay the loan and Brown Brothers would have to wait another seven years to recover its principal and interest. Um, a deep compassion and sympathy for the American bankers is not the moral of this story, nor any, I'll add, though. I just thought that was funny that it's on the website now. <laughs> Convinced that were not for the U.S. military and capital, the whole revolution would have dissolved in minutes, quote, It is an everlasting shame in our great nation that she permits it, Smedley wrote genuinely to his parents, along with noting that he believed the revolution in Nicaragua was one of the bloodiest Central America had ever seen. Luckily for the prideful patron in Smedley, though, a uh, hundred years on, our great nation has all but completely forgot its role in the shameful uh, bloodshed, and doing so by not the slightest accident or happenstance, I might add. Smedley has become an archetypal American hero for this very reason. He's a renegade in the ways that make a good story, disobeying orders to save his men and shouting about politics, but stays in line and follows along with orders near enough to get him eventually the rank of Brigadier General. After retirement, he would go on speaking tours and display a strong pragmatism that so perfectly excited and related to the American populace. His propensity to speak with a damn into hell, as the New York Times reported in the 1920s, led him to the great endearment of the average citizen and veteran. A love of country led to both action, to defend it, and expand it, and later politicking once he realized what his service was really accomplishing. <laughs> he still believed in the ideals that got him to join the military in his youth, even though reality was proving itself to be dissociative from that thought. The two short and damning opening, damning opening paragraphs of War as a Racket could be taken to be directly about Nicaragua, if it were not for all the other wars of the period that looked frightfully similar. <laughs> Quote, conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. After an escapade in Mexico City as a spy, which we can't get to, <laughs> a post in Veracruz and a year home with his family, these words became more true than they have ever been at nearly any time or place in history in Haiti. Butler believed in what he was doing in Haiti potentially more than in any other time or place in his career. 
In correspondence with politicians, he pleaded the cause of the good deeds of his Marines, constructing roads, telegraph and telephone lines, public health facilities, and even running the Postal Service. All good things, sure, but unlike Nicaragua, Smedley was unaware of the grime underneath the surface that caused the nation's revolutions and endemic poverty. He reminisces of a golden age of Haiti underneath French rule, blaming the poverty on the rebellions rather than vice versa, and looking into the underlying cause of the poverty, namely France. A world where his deeds were anything but legitimate and benevolent was incomprehensible, particularly in Haiti, where Butler also helped develop a new type of warfare that we now call counterinsurgency. <laughs> Testifying to a special Senate committee on the occupation, he would say that they were, quote, all imbued that we were trustees of a huge estate that belonged to miners. The Haitians were our wards and that we were endeavoring to make for them a rich and productive property to be turned over to them at, at such a time as our government saw fit, end quote. In Old Gimlet Eye, Butler's story of Haiti is all about him being a modern day cowboy, fighting bandits and protecting civilians, a staunch contradiction for what he would later write in War as a Racket. Like Nicaragua before, Smedley, quote, helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in, and brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests, as he would later write. While the revolutionaries of Haiti were brutal, the background of why seems to have mostly eluded Butler at the time of occurrence. Shocking considering all of his grief with the fighting in Nicaragua were even more prevalent with the fighting and revolution in Haiti. He makes no mention of frustration with the absurdity of American involvement, potentially because, like the Philippines over a decade before, most Americans knew little of Haiti and cared even less. The only notes that are taught today about are about the slave rebellion about Haiti in American schools, and not the strong handing that came after it that doomed the now free island to centuries of poverty and rebellion. In his eyes, the poorly state of the nation was entirely to blame on the Haitian people's inability to establish a stable government. Of course they needed the white man to come in and guide them into civilization, even though it was colonialism in reality and an absurd debt to their freedom which so deeply impoverished them. The nation had been siphoned dry by France in payment for their freedom, <laughs> leading them into a debt trap, taking out loans from the likes of the United States and Germany in order to pay off France. Forced to pay huge chunks of the nation's GDP just on these loans and their interest, eventually Haiti defaulted on these loans. And it was decided among their generous lenders that the US, Germany, and France would simply take ownership of the National Bank and split the shares between them. None other than our old friend Philander Knox brokered this great deal. And ever wants to make good on their investments, the United States launched a bank heist to steal the gold reserves from the Haitian National Bank in order to keep it safe in a Wall Street bank until the debt could be repaid. And none other than the U.S. Marine Corps manned this state-sponsored robbery of over half of sovereign nation's reserves. <laughs> Butler was hand-selected by his old friend Littleton Waller, commander of all U.S. forces in Haiti, to lead the 1st Battalion of the 1st Regiment. Waller had much experience harassing black people as he'd served in a militia as a teenager in Virginia that purposefully interfered with the hypothetical rights of the newly freed black people. <laughs> Waller wrote as if for a job interview that, quote, I know the N-word and how to handle him. The same quality is going to be needed in San Domingo, end quote. Great guy, I know. After the initial invasion, Butler was celebrated by the American-friendly locals and even give a, given a beautiful white horse by the president of Haiti and, quote, the title of big white chief who never slept, according to Butler himself. <laughs> he would go on to lead many expeditions into the Haitian bush and experience some truly harrowing fighting, but he would also develop a fondness for the nation, spawning from a perceived fight, cause to fight for it. That being said, he was in no way championing an equality for these people and continued to talk down on the lowly black Haitians. He was put in charge of a group of Haitian militants, or, quote, my little black army, as he put it, and admitted that he was, quote, beginning to like the little fellows. If that condescension was not enough, he added that, quote, they will do very well in time, as long as the white men lead them, end quote. Completely oblivious to the reality, Smedley soldiered on and continued belittling the locals with any and all the racist colloquialisms a Marine in the 1910s could think of. Butler was outraged when he received news that he was to be awarded a Medal of Honor for his previous involvement in the invasion of Veracruz, and rightfully so, I'll add, because in total 63 people received the Medal of Honor for the short and unjustified seven-month occupation of Veracruz, more for any single action before or since. Understandably, this made the nation's highest honor more than just a little less honorable, and Smedley asked for his to be taken back. 
it was not. In the same letter voicing his frustrations with the honor for Veracruz, he told his father that Colonel Waller had recommended him for yet another Medal of Honor for his actions in the north of Haiti, and expressed that he would happily accept this one. The mission which got him his horse would also get him a second Medal of Honor. He received it eventually by another recommendation for, from Franken, Franklin Roosevelt when he came to visit Haiti to a visit as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and was quite impressed with how he was running things. Whether Butler was happy about this medal is unclear, but he certainly was happy about the work in the country and would begin to call the place, quote, my native land in an odd sense of appropriation, quote, Haiti is a wonderful country and well worth saving, Butler wrote in a letter to Republican House Minority Leader James R. Mann. During the French occupation, which ended in 1804, it seemed enormously rich, but now, owing to the shiftlessness of its population and to the numerous revolutions, it has become extremely poor and is in an entirely underdeveloped condition." End quote. He assured Mann that with, quote, little labor and comparatively small expense, the old French services that he owed the former wealth of the island to can be restored. The gendarmerie, which Butler was heading, would be of small expense because while his salary was $8,814 a year, roughly equivalent to $200,000 in today's money, the enlistation men under Butler, the N-word police force, as he called them, only made a mere $120 a year, around $3,000. <laughs> when they built the roads that are still the main transportation corridor to this day, they paid even less. Nothing, in fact, because as Butler told Mr. Mann, hundreds of civilians, civilians simply volunteered their labor for free, completely uncoerced. He would later admit in Old Gimadai of the strong-armed intimidation tactics he employed to get these volunteers to do all this hard, grueling manual labor. <laughs> Even so, he recollected that it was a national honor to assist the Haitians in getting on their feet. While leading the Haitian Gendarmerie, the United States officially entered the First World War, and it was all Smedley could think of. While proud of the work he was doing in Haiti, it was not a real, proper, and glorious war, a thing which Smedley still held grandiose ideals of. He specifically asked to be moved to Europe, and wrote that his extensive service entitled him to it, but the importance of keeping him in Port-au-Prince made the convincing slow and tedious. His wish was eventually granted, though, not as he had hoped. He was placed in charge of a camp of about about as far from the fighting as one could get in France, <laughs> and promoted to brigadier general and head of a camp of over 60,000 men at times, he committed to, quote, do all in my power to make these poor, miserable, wretched sick soldiers who pass by the thousands through here as comfortable and happy as my poor strength will let me, end quote. He did an exceptional job at it, but would admit that it was the first in a long line of jobs that would kill his drive for soldiering. Quote, Since then, he admitted, a number of experiences have proved to me that opportunities are almost always given in the United States service to men with political or personal influence. A man's record is rarely considered. End quote. Something I think is an interesting observation and complaint, seen as his own father was a congressman for just over 30 years, but... Anyways, if you wouldn't mind, if as we start to, uh draw conclusions, maybe allow me to put on a tweed jacket and cover up some, some poofy-shouldered uh, shirts and get a little philosophical. Draw conclusions and uh, take a sip of coffee. Mm. It's, a, it's an Ethiopian roast, that's great. And let me tell you about why I think Smedley Butler has become as diverse a hero to as diverse a crowd as he has. It's because if a libertarian military hero that decries an offensive military is desired, some of Smedley's later work can be used as prime example. Though in reality, when Butler wrote all those screeds that libertarians now hold to, he was a socialist. And while he was a socialist, he was also an ardent defender of prohibition, going so far as to use the military tactics he developed in Nicaragua and Haiti, in Philadelphia as one of the nation's first truly militarized police forces, to bust people drinking alcohol. <laughs> one that is still used in such a militarized form to this day in Philadelphia. But while he developed a tool that is now used by the militant and ever-increasingly fascist-leaning conservatives, he put a stop to a fascist coup when he was asked to lead an army of veterans against FDR after an attempt to bribe him to, quote, go around and talk to the soldiers in the background and see if we cannot get them to join a great big super organization to maintain the democracy on behalf of some millionaires' attempt to return to the gold standard he uh, overcounted. This whole story, chronicled in a report to a Senate investigation of Nazi propaganda, is worthy of an entire paper in itself. Um, when asked if he was interested in leading this super organization to, quote, help the president, he said, and this is a great one, you gotta, gotta listen to this one. <laughs> 
I am interested in it, but I don't know about heading it. I'm very interested in it because, you know, Jerry, Gerald P. McGuire, my interest is, my one hobby is maintaining a democracy. And if you get these 500,000 soldiers advocating anything smelling of fascism, I'm gonna get 500,000 more and lick the hell out of you. And we'll have a real, real war right here at home. You know that, end quote. That's just such, such a great line. Uh, heroic, maybe. You gotta like, you don't have to like the guy. I don't really like the guy. Anyways, when Butler asked how much money these people were willing to put up to accomplish their goals, insurrectionist goals, he got the number of roughly 300 million, which is about 5 billion today. Paul French, a reporter who Butler trusted enough to tell his story to first, and who he tasked with investigating further, said that McGuire emphasized the need of a strong man on a white horse that might go along with Roosevelt and then do with him what Mussolini did with the King of Italy. <laughs> McGuire had spent some time in Italy and was a great admirer of his fascism and how Mussolini used veterans to gain power, which is why he came to spend the butler in the first place. He was very popular among veterans. When questioned quite lightly by the committee, I'll add, McGuire admitted to having talked to Butler and having received donations, but obviously denied any of the insurrectionist claims. The committee was satisfied to not dig any deeper, and the media largely made fun of Butler for his apocalyptic claims. According to Butler, he was assured that much of the money behind McGuire also controlled the media, so maybe that was some respite for him. Who knows? <laughs> as far as be can, can be surmised, this business plot has become to be known. If you want to research more, that's how you would search it, business plot, Smithy Butler. It was a legitimate conspiracy, though a proper investigation into its breadth is far beyond the simple paper on Smedley Butler and documentary video on Smedley Butler. But what is not beyond us, though, is that Smedley was asked to conspire, and it spooked him enough to get an investigative reporter involved and eventually testify to Congress. Any one of these deeds could make an American hero to just about anyone, but the implied narrative of these individual actions and stories contradict. The Smedley that the libertarian calls a hero is not the same Smedley the anarchist calls a hero, necessarily, but they are the same man. A single anecdote, while fun and interesting, is not a history, and almost any one-liner is markedly false, and thus is the problem with history in general, finding the right line between enough refinement to be useful and too much as to be dishonest. Looking at a life from a century beyond its conclusion in one giant swath, all its idiosyncrasies and contradictions wrapped up into one story seem almost blatantly obvious, but when studying the history of a person, it is crucial to remember the key factory that history studies. Change. Change really is what ought to be looked at when seeking to know someone or something, past or present, and especially when we attempt the oft-futile act of applying the knowledge of the then to the now, somehow. An interesting person who searches for knowledge and wisdom from their life necessarily changes. Personal growth is the only honest move in response to knowledge and experiences, so we have to look at how people change. So writing a definitive conclusion that surmises a clean and easy lesson to learn from an entire life is a mostly futile exercise, but the more we restrict and narrow that conclusion, the closer to accuracy we can actually come. Learning appears to not be much more than refinement on the foggy historical milieu though, to me at least, so extraction of a simplification is needed to get anything out of research. So here we go. This is my best extraction from months of research. Smedley entered the Marine, the military as an idealistic and patriotic teenager, and retired having witnessed and assisted the overthrowing of half a dozen independent nations, the invasion and occupation of even more, and he saw the deaths of many of his colleagues and thousands of citizens from many corners of this planet. Only an omnipotent or unfathomably cruel or selfish being could experience such horrors and come out the other end unchanged. That word, change, as I said, is the critical piece to look at then, because that is where the wisdom or malevolence of the past lies. Butler's experience led him to decry the American empire and her vast stores of capital into being literally a socialist, to the presumably purposely overlooked behest of many modern libertarians that have chosen to cast Butler as an icon for their ideology. <laughs> But a hero narrative is almost exclusively a toxic one, and putting Smedley's actions for the vast majority of his life on a weighted scale of as close to objective morality as we can muster, lanes him, I feel, comfortably on the end of the evil <laughs> on that spectrum. While he did eventually decry the evils of capitalism and speak out against imperialism, he did, after all, spend his whole life ensuring those very interests. But change tells us that he changed and saw the right way, the woe of his ways. Anyways, and as always, thanks for watching. <laughs> All the, the links and stuff in the description.